From CPRI and the CPRI Knowledge Hub, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today, we look at education spending and how the nation's governors are allocating a combined $3 billion in federal coronavirus aid. $3 billion for the governors to split up isn't a ton of money in the scheme of things, but it does give us a sense of what their priorities are. We welcome Phyllis Jordan, editorial director with Future Ed and co-author of a new explainer detailing how states are spending money provided under the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. Kids need the connections and the support and the structure that school gives them. In North Carolina, that's taking the form of hiring nurses and counselors and social workers, and Connecticut is developing a statewide social-emotional learning framework. Illinois has got a student care department now, so there's a really big focus on that. Jordan discusses those spending plans, their potential reverberations beyond the pandemic, and the funding needs that remain as we move further into a new school year. There's going to be a reckoning for state and local budgets, and there's going to need to be another round of COVID funding. When that comes, I'm not sure. That's right now on Research Minutes. Hello, and welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Keith Muller, Managing Editor of the CPRI Knowledge Hub. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Phyllis Jordan, Editorial Director with Future Ed, which is an independent think tank at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Thanks so much for joining us, Phyllis. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks. So today, we're discussing your new explainer, which was co-authored with uh, Javed Siddiqui, President and CEO of the Hunt Institute, titled, How Governors Are Using Their CARES Act Education Dollars. It's now available at future-ed.org, uh, and it offers us a unique look at how the nation's governors are allocating about $3 billion in federal coronavirus aid for education initiatives in their states. Could you walk us through what this funding is and how it was dispersed to states in the wake of the pandemic? Sure. Well, back in March, when the pandemic was first hitting, Congress passed the CARES Act, and they put about $30 billion toward education, about half of that for K-12 schools and half for higher ed, but they left $3 billion just for governors, uh, dispersed generally on population and other formula things. So every governor got a little chunk of money they could spend on whatever they wanted. And so $3 billion is not a lot of money in the whole scheme of things, but it does tell you something about their priorities. We have been waiting patiently since March to see what Congress is going to do next to support schools. But as you probably know, they haven't been able to agree on a package and they haven't even been able to agree what sort of form the aid should take. So we decided let's take a look at what governors are doing with the money they already have. And when, as we started at Future, it started to look, we realized our friends at the Hunt Institute were already tracking this. So we got together with them and sort of analyzed we set up about 10 different priorities to look at what the governors are doing with the money. So let's jump right into how those governors are spending this money. Um, and I wanted to start, if we could, with the anomalies. Um, are any states doing anything particularly unique or straying from the pack in how they're spending these GEER funds? Uh, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy is spending all of his money on higher education. He's the only person doing that. Most are spending a mix, but uh, Gavin Newsom in California is spending um, all of his on closing learning gaps in K-12. Now, he he defines closing learning gaps fairly broadly, but it's all going to K-12. You know, Henry McMaster in South Carolina is spending two-thirds of his money on private school scholarships, which is certainly an anomaly. Throughout the summer, we saw a significant push from some stakeholder groups and even federal officials to reopen schools. I'm curious if that had any impact on how governors have allocated this funding. You know, surprisingly few governors put much of their discretionary money toward reopening schools. This could be a function of when the money was allotted. I mean, the CARES Act was passed in late March. The money started flowing in the spring. This was really when schools were still in remote mode. And it was before school reopening became such a big political thing. So what we found is that only about six or seven governors put their discretionary dollars toward reopening. Of course, there's other money you can spend, but in terms of discretionary dollars. Uh, but a lot of them, 35 to 36, spent money on remote learning. And they really put money toward improving this experience, both for uh, students and teachers. 
So could you give us some examples of how states are using this funding to support remote instruction this year? Sure. Uh, it pretty much falls into three buckets. The first is broadband and internet access. At the start of the pandemic, schools discovered that so many of their students had no access to the internet. The estimates are between 9 to 12 million households with students in them don't have internet access or didn't last spring. And this is particularly a problem in rural areas, as I'm sure you can imagine, but it's some na urban neighborhoods have very little internet access. You know, those a lot of kids had relied on going to the library or uh, getting their internet access after school at school, and suddenly those avenues were shut down. So governors uh, spent a lot of money on hotspots, on internet contracts, on expanding broadband in their areas. They put Wi-Fi in school buses. They broadcast it out of their schools. They just use a lot of innovative approaches to get more broadband access and more internet access to kids. The second bucket is devices. Internet access doesn't do you much good if you don't have a computer or a tablet to use it on. And a lot of families don't have those, or they have one, and they've got three kids and a parent trying to work from home. So it's hard for kids to get onto a class, a live class on Zoom, if their older brother's using the only computer. So a lot of governors invested in buying tablets and other devices. Arkansas, for instance, bought 20,000 devices. The third bucket is training and instruction for remote learning. You know, teachers and students were really thrust into this without much knowledge of how online learning is different from in-classroom learning. I mean, most teachers just sort of started doing their in-classroom lessons online, but there are real people who've done this for a while know there are real strategies for how you can use online learning for collaboration or you can uh, sort of flip things so kids are watching lectures but then doing certain work at home. So uh, the, a lot of money went toward that sort of training. Some states uh, use the money to make sure AP classes were available online. So curriculum training, that's just how to use the remote and even how to use the equipment. A lot of people didn't know how to do that. And there's been a lot of training on all of that. Two common concerns we've seen since the onset of the pandemic are learning gaps, which researchers believe will widen for many students following this year. And Students' socio-emotional well-being, which is certainly being tested right now during these extended periods of remote instruction that we're seeing, what are states doing to address those issues? We found at least 16 governors were designating money for closing learning gaps. I mean, research has, all, has shown that, you know, over the summer or when kids are out of school, they lose or fall behind in their learning. So this six-month gap of not being in school is certain to cause some learning losses. So, you know, a lot of times that took the form of summer learning. Florida spent $64 million on summer learning programs. Uh, other states are doing tutoring, after-school programs. Massachusetts is spending $10 million to address early literacy gaps. Alabama spent, is spending $9 million on tutoring. And as you said, social-emotional learning, another dimension of learning, is important kids need the connections and the support and the structure that school gives them, and they're not getting much of that. So there needs to be different ways of reaching out to kids and also identifying the kids who need help. So 11 governors put money in their budget toward that. Uh, North Carolina, that's taking the form of hiring nurses and counselors and social workers. And Connecticut is developing a statewide social-emotional learning framework. Illinois has got a student care department now. So there's a really big focus on that. And beyond the students, a, a, a lot of governors put money towards supporting families. Often this took the form of providing food. I mean, already schools are using their uh, money for student meals to provide family meals, but, but some governors up to that. And others uh, expanded the access to health, telehealth for families so that more people have access to health in the pandemic. The switch to remote instruction has been particularly challenging for students with special needs. Are we seeing any examples of states using these funds to offer more support to them? Yes. Um, we had at least six states explicitly mention special, uh, special health care needs and students with disabilities, and others are through their uh, learning gap programs addressing these needs. But some of them, like Texas is investing in a virtual dyslexia intervention. Uh, some states are uh, providing special funding for specialized schools that deal with the deaf and the blind. There's a big push to provide technology within the technology remote learning area. A lot of governors, you know, include 
ways to reach out to kids with disabilities because that's a hard population to reach. And often uh, you need specialized software and training for that. In today's divided political climate, I was surprised to see in the article that you note that spending trends seem to be mostly bipartisan, uh, with the single exception of private schooling. So can you tell us what you learned there? Yeah, four governors, all of them Republican, are giving part of their CARES Act discretionary dollars to fund private school scholarships. This is happening, uh, the biggest, well, the biggest is Florida, where they're spending about $45 million toward various private school priorities. But the biggest share is in South Carolina, where Henry McMaster, as I said earlier, has put $32 million of his $48 million in discretionary funds toward what's known as a tax credit scholarship, which is where money goes to a private organization that then gives scholarships to kids who then go to private schools. There's right now a lawsuit to try to block that, saying that state Supreme Court doesn't allow the state to give money to private schools, but the state is arguing, well, we're not giving it to private schools. We're giving it to students, and they're going to private schools. So that's something to follow. But uh, it does uh, say something about what are the priorities of these governors. And, uh, you know, this, of course, comes amid other attempts to use CARES Act dollars for private schools. Uh, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos released an interim rule that would have required school districts to share more of the public money with private schools. That rule was shut down by three federal judges and has now been removed. But Republicans in Congress are trying to get private school funding into the next COVID aid bill, uh, which is a non-starter with Democrats. I mean, their, their reasoning is if public schools are shut down, we should have uh, people want to go to private schools, we should help them out because we're not giving them the public school. But uh, the reality is, is that public schools are going to be hurting for funds. Uh, there's a big drop in tax revenue for state and local governments, and they're going to need every penny they've got. So after performing such a, a detailed national review, I'm, I'm curious what your main takeaways are. As someone who spent many years covering education here in America, do you think these measures and this level of funding might be enough to see us through the pandemic? Or do you think more resources are going to be needed to support students in the months and potentially years ahead? Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, and as I said from the start, $3 billion for the governors to split up isn't a ton of money in the scheme of things, but it does give us a sense of what their priorities are. And for those governors who are devoting scarce public dollars to sending students to private school, that says a lot about their priorities. Another takeaway is that the decisions to invest in remote learning equipment and training could well turn out to be money well spent. There was some consternation in, you know, at the start of the school year. It's like, oh, no, we've spent our whole summer preparing for in-person school, and now we're going remote and we're not prepared. But in fact, there's been millions of dollars spent to prepare for remote learning. So that puts us in better position than we were six months ago. And there could well be repercussions for this beyond the pandemic. For instance, on a snow day, teachers could get all their kids to sign up on Zoom and then everybody could have a lesson and there's no such thing as a snow day anymore. Sorry, kids. There's kids who have children who have illnesses that keep them homebound. This could be a way that they could keep learning if there's some way to do this sort of remote learning for them. And there's also potential to flip instruction, which just means... Typically, you go to school and you listen to your teacher talk and then you come home and you do your homework. But what if you went home with a tape of your teacher talking and you listen to your teacher and then you, at school you did the collaborative work with your classmates? In terms of whether this is enough money, no. Uh, the $13 billion that went to K-12 schools in the CARES Act is like a fraction of what I mean, the airlines got $58 billion in the same bill. Schools rely heavily on state and local revenue. State and local revenue are way down with the pandemic. People aren't shopping. They aren't making money. They aren't buying things. So state, there's going to be a reckoning for state and local budgets. And there's going to need to be another round of COVID funding. When that comes, I'm not sure. Well, this is just incredible work that you've done, uh, Phyllis, and we want to encourage our listeners to go read the full article. Again, it's titled 
how governors are using their CARES Act education dollars, and you can find it at future-ed.org. Phyllis Jordan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. This has been great. I appreciate your time. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. For more episodes or to subscribe to the series, you can find us at researchminutes.org. To share thoughts on today's episode or to suggest a future topic, you can follow us on Twitter at CPRI Hub. That's C-P-R-E 